welcome to Journey Through the Gate, your paranormal portal podcast, as we delve into the many questions and wonders brought on by the supernatural experience. What's on the other side of the gate? Let's find out together. Welcome to Journey Through the Gate, and tonight we have a little paranormal royalty with us. As far as I'm concerned, he is he is all about the paranormal for me. So to get the mood a little set and to kind of give you an idea where we're going here, I wanted to read just a little thing that you might recognize. We cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggle here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. Now, if that sounds familiar, Abraham Lincoln, November 19th, 1863. Now, that's just a little something to remind you that what we're going to talk about tonight was one of the bloodiest battles ever fought on American soil. These were men. These were human beings They were young, they were old, they were fighting for whatever reason made them sign up because there was nothing else they could do because they were fighting for their rights, because they felt like they had to because it was their duty. And some of them are still fighting. The gentleman I have on tonight is one of the foremost authorities on Gettysburg. He is an author. He is a paranormal investigator. He is the founder of one of the first ghost hunting uh, tours, and in my opinion, one of the classiest, and that's candlelight ghost uh, hunting tours in Gettysburg. Tonight, please welcome Mr. Mark Nesbitt. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, Cisco. That's a very nice uh, introduction there. I appreciate that. And uh, I almost and cried. i got to be honest. You know, <laughs> for, yeah, to the point that, uh, you know, what you read there of the Gettysburg Address is, uh, is, is pretty much sums up the, um, you know, the aftermath of the battle. And what, what Lincoln, of course, was trying to do was not only dedicate the National Cemetery there, but he took the opportunity to, to try and rededicate the nation to the cause uh, of the Civil War, uh, the northern cause of the Civil War, which was to uh, end slavery and reunite the country. So I, I, I like that, that intro very much. Well, thank you. And that's that's kind of where I'm sitting with this, because you cannot uh, pick up one of your books. And one of my favorite was the uh, the journal um, of... Oh, 35 Days to Gettysburg. Oh, gosh, yeah. Because you're you're getting it from their perspective... And you're getting it in their words. And I read that several times because um, I've gone to Gettysburg, but my reason for going many times is not even on my own. It's just, you know, I want to go and if I could get somebody to listen, you know, I just wanted to tell them, hey, you're not forgotten, you know, and your fight is over. And, you know, it's like, um, it's just, it seems like we've forgotten that ghosts were human beings. If you get, if you get my point, and it's oh yeah yeah, and you're talking 150 now we're what at 154 or something like that years, uh yeah okay, and they're still in in a lot of respect. Of course, some are residual, and some is just echoes of the past, and some are just imprints. We get that, but the ones that are there and intelligent hauntings, which you've bumped into multiple, um, you know, some of them don't even realize they're dead. You know, and they're they're still caught up. They're still caught up. And then to go in there, you can imagine, and of course I'm telling you things you already know, but to go in there and watch, you know, hour by hour, probably I don't know how many different ghost tours going through the battle, and then having groups of people that are carrying themselves different, they're speaking different, um, of all this equipment, um, it just seems crazy to me to then add on you know impertinent questions like what was a war like and how's it feel to be shot you know and then Uh they wonder 
why they're getting either slapped or <laughs> or not or nothing, nothing at all. You know, they're uh -huh. not getting any result whatsoever. And you have a different approach to that. You want to tell us a little bit about that? I mean, even even with the cookies, I thought that was just wonderful, but, you know. Yeah, respect, yeah. respect. Well, the, you know, that's the whole point. I mean, you have to imagine yourself, um, you know, if, if if these spirits live in another dimension or another, another, I'll call it heaven or nirvana or whatever you want to call it, um, I kind of think it's sort of, sort of like sitting in your in your favorite house, in your own house, in your living room, in your favorite, most comfortable chair. All of a sudden, you hear somebody kick in the door and they're smoking a cigarette, and they're yelling, hey, does anybody here want to talk to me? I mean, you know, you would be like, uh, no, I don't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, and not to mention the fact that with all the equipment that's available now, it seems kind of silly to go into a haunted area with like an EMF meter, wander around attempting to bump into a ghost. When we know very well that they can, they have a, a, a virtually unbelievable mode of travel. They can go anywhere they want. They're not bound by this physical body anymore, and so they can come to you. And we have um, done this in a number of of meth a num number of places, and we call it um, uh, intuitive, the intuitive method. In other words. Mm -hmm. We're all a little bit psychic. We need to develop that more. We used to be, when we were children, very psychic. That's been drummed out of us. Yes. But we need to get back to that, the feeling uh, of, of where there might be spiritual energy. Mm -hmm. And I do mean energy. I mean physical, scientific energy that we can follow our, our feelings towards and, and then, then communicate as you were saying, on a um, on a more human level, rather than just provoking or trying to trying to get somebody mad at you so they'll strike out at you, you know, the, this makes much more sense to me when you're doing a paranormal investigation. Absolutely, and and with myself too, and I know from reading your books and listening to interviews and speaking to you in person you kind of feel the same way as, you know, this is a human being you're talking to. Not only are you speaking to a human being, and for, but for people that don't know, um, tell us a little bit about what that time was like. I mean, you know, husband and wife would go into town and they wouldn't even call each other by their first name. It'd be Mr. And Mrs. Smith or Mr. And Mrs. Robinson. You know, they had their belief, their religious beliefs were very black and white. You know, so there right. you got your fear base, which is probably why a lot of them didn't cross other than just the being dead so quickly and, you know, the circumstances. But tell us a little bit about that time. Well, it's called the Victorian era, <laughs> excuse me, and um, it named after Queen Victoria. A little, you know, we have a tendency to think that it's, uh, and probably truly that it was a, a little more uh, uh, formal, as you say, people would, would refer to their spouses as Mr. or Mrs. when they went went out in public. Um, it was a little more formal uh, society back in those days. And so that's why it's kind of important when you're addressing these people that that you're not you're not talking to you know criminals. You're not in a in a, a setting like a, a prison or a penitentiary. Uh, mm -hmm. you're 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 in their homes in many cases, for example, in our building at the, where we run the Ghosts of Gettysburg tours out of at, on two, at 271 Baltimore Street there in Gettysburg. It was a Civil War house, and um, the one family lived there uh, from, from 1866 to 1914, so they owned the place the longest. Kitz Miller, this is Kitzmiller, it's still there. I mean, she's a very, very active spirit. In our in our building, we communicate with her. She she communicates back with us, and many times is is <laughs> is not pleased with what we're doing. <laughs> it lets us know, but uh, and so we we actually we have built, done several things to, to to alleviate her concerns, and so um, and we get along now. And it's, uh, it, but that, that's, that's, you know, it's her house too, is the way mm -hmm. I look at it. I just happen to be paying the mortgage at this particular yeah. stage of the game. But, uh, you know, she, she owns that house as much as I do. Although when there's problems, you know, a leak or something, 
I hear from my mediums that she wants me to take care of it. You know what I mean? So <laughs> she so gets funny. on my case. That's yeah. so funny. And it's just, time is just a relative thing. You know, it just seems like layers, almost like pages in a book. Do you know what I mean? It's like the, 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 that land was there. And then everything that happened on that in that same spot. And it's almost just like layers in time. And, and sometimes they they mesh, you know, or one crosses over into the next almost. It's 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 amazing. And I totally agree about, you know, uh, the energy. And, you know, we've learned. Um, you also said in one of your books about how much has paranormal investigation changed and what have we learned you know, to keep going uh-huh. back into a a place where you know there's activity, and boy, is there activity in Gettysburg. Um, but to go in there to prove that there's a ghost there is kind of like to me, like going into a bar to prove there's beer. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, you don't need to. You know, that's so many times. I think a lot of the, for example, especially the uh, places and or the uh, programs on TV now. Are, they just want to, they want proof that there are are ghosts, mm-hmm. and we know that there are. We don't need to pro- prove that. In fact, my my next book coming out probably um, the beginning of July, Ghosts of Gettysburg Eight. I I address it not as deeply as I would like to, but I address uh, that very both time and and its effects, and also um, the uh, the fact that um, you know we know that ghosts exist exist we don't need to know that anymore what we need to do is is perfect our communication with them mm-hmm. and let them tell us what they know uh of the rest of the the rest of existence mm-hmm. not just this existence but the rest of it that we all are headed towards eventually so mm-hmm. that's that's i think my next step is where where i'm headed also yeah and, and i think that's wonderful and something i'm very interested in too is uh ghost prevention and i know that sounds so funny but i have people ask me all the time well you know what makes a ghost stay or you know free will mm-hmm. did they choose not to cross over and why you know or mm-hmm. if you can get it to the point where they do know they're dead and they do know that they made a choice what made them stop and it seems like number one is fear of the other side you know i did this i did that i don't want you know i don't want to yeah. cross over or you know they always say like unfinished business or i want to contact this one or that one and when you're standing there talking to a, a soldier on a battlefield that, you know, it's 154 years, the people that they want to see are no longer there. They're on the other side. So if we could get them to go over there, <laughs> you know, it, that right. kind of thing, you know. Um, okay, so I know you've been doing this a long time, and I know you have some fantastic stories. And... I, you know, I'm not going to ask you the typical question. What's the scariest thing you ever saw? Because I know you, and I know that things don't they intrigue you more than scare you. Like, what was that? Let me go see what that is. Which is, you know, it's it's just a persona that you've fallen into. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the the um, fascination, yep, uh, and the and and the, and the inquisitiveness in me, I think. It, it outweighs any fear. I mean, yeah, you get you get the you get the heebie-jeebies, you get the willies okay. in certain situations. Um, but like I like I always say, you know, we have uh, in the group that I'm with. When you you're in a dark place and the door slams, mm-hmm. you run towards it mm-hmm. <laughs> to right. find out what it was. What is that? And to debunk whatever it was. You know what I mean? Right, right. You know, one of the. So, not to cut you right. off, but I got to get you to tell me about the uh, blood stains because I thought that oh. was so cool. There's so much in that that really gives us a lot of perspective on. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Do you mind telling well, that? That was. Excuse me, not at all. Um, that was. I I can't classify that as as one of the scariest things that ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. Although. Retrospectively, yeah, it is kind of scary, uh, but it was one of definitely one of the weirdest things that ever happened. I mean, I've had some pretty weird things happen on the on our investigations, mm-hmm. but I was even on a formal investigation. Um, there's a there's a a farm not too far from the downtown of Gettysburg, a couple miles outside of town, called the Daniel Lady Farm. It was um, uh, a hospital 
uh, used at the time of their, it was a farm that was used as a hospital at the time of the battle. And um, the front room had the southern exposure, not to mention the fact that it had blood stains from the battle that just wouldn't come out of the wooden floor. And so the organization that, that purchased it to to preserve it, the Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association, uh, renovated the place. And it was being used as kind of a semi-working farm. They had a caretaker out there who worked the fields and just watched over the place. So I got a phone call from him one day, and um, he said, Mark, if you want to see a paranormal thing happen and right before your eyes, come on out <laughs> to the lady farm. I said, oh, geez, I can't pass that up, can I? So I threw all the gear in the van and and went out there. And um, I, got, I had my video camera going as soon as I walked up to the door, and I knocked on the door, and I'm thinking, what's going to happen? Is something going to fly out of me or what? Mm -hmm. And uh, he opened the door, and he said, I don't want to say anything. I just want you to know a couple things, that we had cleaned this place beautifully because we had a tour the other day of Confederate soldiers, and we brought them into the, to the front room here, which was the operating room. He said, and then this morning, that was yesterday, then this morning we went in, and we found this, and he opened the door, we walked in, and there, on this wooden floor, were streams of a rust-colored liquid. There were droplets of this liquid, and, and it, was, it was crystallizing inside the droplets. And on the, uh, on the edges, it, was, it seemed to be a, a clear serum that was separating itself from this, this liquid. And mm. I'm looking at it and videotaping this. And I looked at the ceiling to think maybe a pipe had broken and, and the, the ceiling was whitewashed. And I said to him, I said, what, did a pipe break in the basement? And he said, no, this just appeared. And I'm looking at it and we got a yardstick. So I took a bunch of photographs of it. And I said, do you have a, a, a tissue? And he said, yeah. So I took a, a tissue and I dipped it in it. And I, I just looked at him. I said, I, I don't know what to say. You know, I think I've done all I can do here. Like, you know, he says, oh, I, don't, I can't clean this up. I'm not, I don't have time to clean it up. I don't know what it is. He said, i got to go out in the fields. i got some work to do. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, all right. So he left, and I left. And about two hours later, I got another phone call from him in just two words. He said, it's gone. Mm. I said, what? He said, I came back uh, from the field just a minute or two ago, and I looked in, in the room. It's gone. So I jumped back in the van, zoomed out there, and I have the videotape going as I walk in the door. And I walk through the door, and, and sure enough, it's, it's, just, it's vanished. And I have a video of him uh, squatting down and rubbing his hand over. He said, it was right here, wasn't it? I said, yeah. And he said, what the heck? He lifts up his hand, and, and all you can see in the video on his fingers, there's a very, very thin film of dust mm. on his fingers. And I'm like, what in the heck? And my, my wife, Carol, was there, so she said, I wonder if the samples that you took are still intact. And they were out in the car. She ran out there, and sure enough, they were still intact. Mm -hmm. So she, uh, we, we, we just had no idea what was going on here except something very strange. So, but the uh, Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association is very well connected. And they took the samples sent them to a forensics lab um, and uh, in Pennsylvania, and the results three weeks later came back. The liquid that I'd taken those photographs of and that I'd seen was blood, mm. and the species was human. Human blood. All that blood, all that human blood just vanished. It was there. I mean, I got a video of it. Wow. And the other interesting thing is that over in the corners of the of the uh, room on Spain for 150 some years, stained is the original blood of the soldiers who had amputations in that room mm. that Mrs. Lady could not remove. I don't, you know how much did she try and get that stuff up, and it just would not come up. Human blood doesn't come out of that. Yeah. So uh, that was that was pretty much the strangest. 
the yeah. strangest, weirdest, maybe even scariest thing that's that's ever happened to me. Well, just you know, and and thanks to Carol, she's kind of like the you know the driving force behind you know the whole <laughs> that you know both ah. of you together to think of to do that because um, gosh, you know, just to see that it, you know it was human blood, obviously. You know, they don't want yeah. to be forgotten. You know, they're going to manifest the way they can. And people don't quite understand the whole energy thing. A lot of times people ask me, you know, well, how come I just saw a head? I mean, I had that personal experience. And it took right. me years to figure out, okay, well, that's all the energy he he had to manifest. You also have right. a story about, I think it was a general, was it not? Where the, the head appeared to one person and then again later? Right. Right, maybe the only person that we can actually identify, the only ghost that we can actually identify, and we, I believe it was the ghost of uh, General Reynolds. Mm -hmm. It was out at the um, seminary, um, and um, Reynolds, of course, was the Union uh, commander of the, you know, the First Corps that arrived there about 10 o'clock in the morning of July 1st, 1863, and was shot in the in the back of the back of the neck, the lower part of his skull, and so virtually immediately became the highest ranking Union officer to die in the battle, mm. and they took his body then back to a place called the George George House on Steinwer Avenue, and if you draw a line, you realize that, that from from where he was, was shot to the George George House, it goes just about where this dormitory is on the Lutheran Theological Seminary campus, and it was a seminarian who got in touch with me, and he said, um, I, the weirdest story, I, he said something happened to me, you know, just a month or so ago, or six years ago, and he said, what, uh, he said, I was asleep, sound asleep in the dorm room, and I heard this scream from down the hall, it woke me up, it was so loud, and then I, and I realized it was, you know, it was one o'clock in the morning, he says, I realized it was um, my buddy, so I have no idea what he was doing, but I was too tired. I didn't want to get up and, and go find out. So I just went back to sleep. He said, about an hour later, I was awakened by an absolutely freezing cold room. And I thought I'd left the window open and the, and the temperature dropped. He said, I went to close the window was closed. But when I looked across the room, I saw um, half of a man standing there. Mm -hmm. It just from the way he stopped. He said it was very weird. He said the guy had a dark face, a dark beard, and he was dressed in a dark, looked like a uniform. And he said he did everything he could. He prayed. He 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 tried to command the person to get out. And finally, after a minute or two, he finally started to get out of bed to defend himself, and the image vanished. Well, a couple of days after that, he ran into his buddy that he heard scream, and he said, what in the world were you, were you goofing around, or what were you doing? And the guy got real serious. He said, no. He said, about one o'clock, middle of the night, he said, I woke up, and there was a head floating in my room, and it, and he said, it was just the head, and the guy said, what did it look like? He said, well, it had a dark beard. And it was kind of darkly, uh, you know, dark face. And basically, they just, he described the same guy. So I brought a picture, a photograph of um, actually a couple of generals. And I showed this the, the, the fellow who told me the story. And he picked out General Reynolds. He said, that was the guy yeah. that visited me in my room. But as you point out, it was only a partial manifestation Right. And I agree. I think it all depends on the kind of energy mm -hmm. that that they can borrow. Right. Well, they get it from us. If they can't get it from equipment around, right. like batteries, we all know, you know, batteries drain, this happens, you know, yeah. the lights flicker. They're pulling energy. And I've, I've learned, of course, they're all theories, but aren't they all, you know, at this point, you know, we can't. It's so well, hard sure, to yeah. prove things. But. I've been told that, uh, you know, if they haven't crossed, they, they're pulling energy from the lower vibrational things, you know, like fear and, you know, um, stuff like that, or, or the things around them, the energy things around them, to, you know, toys, batteries, cameras, whatever. 
So if that, if he manifested in, was able to materialize in one form, you know, only so much, once he got all that fear, the guy's praying, he's going to get out. I mean, that's fear. That's, you know, that's adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Maybe it gave him enough energy to then manifest more to the next one. That's that's a very good uh, possibility. I, I agree with that. I also know that um, they do borrow energy from not only equipment but from us, mm -hmm. and maybe that may be the reason why I get so many stories coming from the Gettysburg College campus. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Some people so have more energy than anybody, you know, <laughs> and especially <laughs> and, on a Saturday night or a football game or whatever. So yeah, and the um, sheer t and uh, the sheer tonnage of electronic equipment. You know, everybody's got a laptop and a cell phone and lights and batteries sure. all over the place. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons why I get so many stories from Gettysburg College is because of that mm -hmm. all the energy that's there. Isn't that the where um, in Penn Hall the elevator? Correct. Oh, please. I would, I've would. i told this story so many times to hear it from you on my show would be amazing. Please, please tell it. <laughs> okay. Well, it, because there's also some follow-ups on that, too, which Fantastic. I'll tell you. Um, the original story came to me from a couple of friends uh, that week. They were working late one night at Pennsylvania Hall. It's called Pennsylvania Hall now, like in the time of the battle was it was it was old dorm because there were dormitories there was one of three buildings on the Gettysburg College campus and um of course all the major the large buildings in town as the Union Army passed through town and that became the rear uh echelon all the surgeons then commandeered all the large buildings uh churches uh, schools and this particular building because it was just about the biggest one in the area as for hospitals, we know that the operations went on in the lower floors because of the, the, the descriptions of the weird pyramids that people would see at the, underneath the windows on the first floor that they couldn't identify until they got closer and they realized they were amputated hands and arms and feet and legs that, it, that surgeons had just tossed out the windows. The upper floors then were used for uh, recovery. So... Fast forward to the 1980s, and, and this the two women that I knew were working late one night, it was about 11 o'clock, because Pennsylvania Hall then became the administration building mm -hmm. for Gettysburg College. They got, they decided to pack it in, and they got in the elevator, pressed the button for the first floor, which is the exit, started going down the elevator, went past the first floor, mm -hmm. down towards the basement. She's going, oh my goodness, what is going on? They're pushing the first floor button to try and get to go back up. Kind of going up the elevator in the hall, the doors opened, and they looked out into a scene that's just completely out of time and out of any kind of reason. It was a hospital scene that they saw, a Civil War hospital scene. Hmm. They saw men around leaning up against wounded men, leading men leaning up against the walls. They saw a table, uh, the makeshift operating table in the middle of the room, a surgeon with a bloody apron. Uh, they started to panic. They had no idea. They were panicking. They didn't know what was going on. They're pressing the buttons. Nothing would move. Apparently, a a, a young man, a, a, an orderly, which sounded like their description to me, came around the corner and was no more than two feet from the door and looked at them and, and pleaded basically with his eyes, you know, either let me get on there with you or and get out of this mm -hmm. scene that I've been in forever or come out here and help me help me they yeah. did not want to do yeah yeah finally the doors closed and the, and the elevator went up they ran immediately to the um to the security office to report this and i interviewed the security officer that was on he later became head of security at, at gettysburg college he said i remember that i remember them calling. they were scared to death and so we went over but i figured it was a fraternity you yeah. know prank playing a prank and I figured there's no way they're going to clean up the mess they described. So we got back on the elevator, went, and this is within a minute or two, went all the way down, opened the doors, and the basement was pristine. It was all whitewashed walls. The cages were they kept all the all the supplies and equipment for the college over there. And then the and he said, in fact, the, the and I've seen this. I've been down in there. Uh, not ten feet from the door is a is a 
cinder block wall, which was whitewashed and all the electrical equipment, all the electrical um, outlets and boxes are on that. So there was nothing to, not, nobody to arrest, nobody to blame for this. And he went back up to the, uh, to the first floor and left. Now, the interesting part is, is that this is in the mid-1980s. I got a, um, I was doing an autographing at Gettysburg College store, and um, a couple came in, and a guy said, yeah, I knew that woman that happened to. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, you, you knew such and such? He said, no. I said, well, then you knew such and such? No. I said, wait a minute. And he gave me a completely different name. The situation was that not that she was working for the college, she was working for a firm that was auditing the college. They were, she was they were all on the, the, the upper floor and they asked her to go down to the car and get some, uh, um, uh, get some paperwork. She got on the elevator, went down, and exactly the same thing happened. Mm. The same vision happened to her. I called her up. She eventually moved to um, Denver and I interviewed her and she her description was Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Did she have any eye contact with it? Did anybody kind of recognize her in the same type of way? Did you know I, would, I am going, I'm going to have to look over my notes, but I believe that they, that, you know, when the door is open to the elevator, she got a response. Okay. Uh, from the surgeon or from someone else that looked that way. Right. It was it's my impression that that's what happened. Be- that is the one part of that story. I mean, the whole thing is amazing, without a doubt. But, of course, I'm going to look at it from an empathic, sensitive, intuitive, mediumistic kind of way. If you know what I mean, I'm just looking at it in sure. a different way. That one is always just, I just want to say broke my heart because I'm thinking, okay, first of all, what did he see, you know, when that elevator came down and opened? Did, did he see... Um, in his eyes, you know, two women coming to help, you know, rip bandages and that kind of thing. Did he see two angels to him? Did he see, from his perspective, did he see what that they actually look like too, like a rip in time? Um, and just pleading for help. Uh, the, the energy down there, of course, it, every house in Gettysburg just about was used <laughs> for a hospital of some sort. I'm sure yeah, that yeah. was as well. Um and my thing is, like, you know, how long is that guy going to go through this? Is it just him and that's his perception? Is it everybody a collective mass? Is it residual with intelligent? I mean, the questions just, like, bombard my head when I think about this story. Definitely more questions than answers, that's Absol- for sure. Absolutely. I mean, now, I'm the kind of uh, nutter that would say, okay, I'm going to sit in the basement <laughs> You know, with some dousing rods. I don't even want to record it. You know, I'm just so not interested in that. You know, I mean, it would be nice to have the recording. But I just feel like all that equipment kind of puts them off. Just go in there and go, look, you know, I'm a human being. You know, I'm here with this intent. Let me help you. Do you see what I mean? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I I think that will probably work. Yeah. Well, that's the thing we were saying in the beginning, too, Mark. You know, I've heard you say that you've gotten great EVPs or a friend of yours did on a a SpongeBob SquarePants recorder. Yes. (laughs) Right. I know. But there's so um, a lot of these young people that are, you know, genuinely interested and of course, you know, uh, they're so smart, you know, I mean, they grew up in this tech, you and I are in, of the, you know, time where, you know, you could make a phone call for a dime from a telephone booth that doesn't even exist anymore. You know, I mean, tech right. has changed so much in our lifetime. Right. But sometimes the simplest things work. I can honestly tell you, I have stood in that field. Now it's hard. I, my thing was, I was hot. It was Halloween night in Gettysburg and it was odd because they oh. didn't celebrate it. You know, I expected to see like Mardi Gras, but the streets were very quiet. There was ghost tours and everything else. I think they celebrated it on a different evening. You know, there was actually more uh-huh. security than there were people in the street. If you know what I mean, of course there would have yeah. to be, would have to be. I can't imagine what it's like for, you know, from that side of it, you were on that side of it as a guard and security, but, to stand on that field and you just have a, a small little flashlight and you've got the dousing rods and you come in and you say, read my intent. 
I'm here to speak with you. I don't, I'm not going to ask you impertinent questions and use up your energy. You know, please excuse me for, you know, I, I figured I was insulting them just by wearing pants. If you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, yeah, they but, would uh, yeah, react to that. But yeah, and I did, and I apologized. And I said, look, I was a soldier. You were a soldier. I said, I know I don't look like one. I happen to have my two sons with me. They were born in Alabama, and I was born in New Jersey. So I took that approach. I said, look, you know, mm -hmm. what you've done here has not been forgotten. Somewhere along the way, we all came together. And I mean, I was starting to get responses. You know where I was standing? And maybe you can tell me a little bit about the, I'm sure there's many battles there, but there's the high school. I think uh -huh. it's a high school and there's a football field and then there's a field. There's a huge uh -huh. witness tree. It's right. If you walk out of Farnsworth and walk across the street. Right. Okay. And then you uh -huh. can stand by the witness tree and look out and you can see the beginning of what looks like a dirt uh, path, a trail that's pretty much chained off you're not supposed to go there but that's where yep. I was can you tell me a little bit about the battle there I've heard so many things um I'm sure there were skirmishes and stuff like that but what exactly right. kind of went on around that tree let's see if it matches well, up right, with what they told me if you were looking down the uh that pathway you were on a probably on the road uh there and um right behind you would have been um uh east of cemetery hill mm-hmm down the road a little bit, the the, the uh, Macadam Road, the, the paved road, across that area was the charge of the Louisiana Tigers. Okay. And they made it all the way up to the, the top, hand-in-hand, -hand, with the gunners of the batteries, uh, artillery, that, that were up there, and then were eventually driven back. So that whole area where the stadium was mm -hmm. and all that, that whole area was uh, fought over and advanced across by Confederate troops. Mm -hmm. And so that that was that would have been the historic um uh underpinnings of that of that place. The witness tree, of course all the you know Yeah. It's not just the trees. I mean we do have oh, witness yeah. trees there, but I mean you have the earth itself, yep. the rocks, many of the rock walls were there at the time. So um the, uh, the the potential to tap into another layer of of time is is there absolutely, and that's exactly what I felt because you could feel a change from the street. To, now again, we're talking about feelings, and unfortunately, the past fifteen years they almost took the feeling out of it. If you're going by television shows and things like that, took it, and I understand why they did that. They wanted to take a more scientific approach, but I think now we're starting to meld them together the way they should be, little at a time. And I know you're trying to do that as well. You you started yeah. that years ago. But basically, that was it, Mark. I'm walking, and, you know, the only way I could get there was to go on a tour. Because otherwise, I would have uh -huh. been in cuffs. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, at that night, Halloween night, for Pete's sake, it's 12 o'clock Halloween night. But basically, I'm walking, and I took the dowsing rods, I took the EMF meter, and I just kind of walked and as soon as it started to light up, I, I set it down and I just went with what I was feeling because there's so much. It feels like you have that lead blanket on you just if you're any kind of empath or have a heart at all. The heaviness, mm -hmm. you know, you yeah. know what I mean. Sure, sure. And I I just stopped. I took the dowsing rods out and I said, okay, you know, is there someone here who's willing to talk to me? Yes. They knew what was going on. I mean, they've seen equipment every hour on the hour. I did my apologies, my intent, and whatever, and I look up, and I promise you they were sitting in the tree. Because if you think about it, the tree has changed slightly over time. It's grown, but that wood hedgerow, you know, I mean, you know, right. yeah, you've got the buildings, you've got the lights, you've got everything else. They basically told me uh, they were sticking to that because that hadn't changed much, and they were grouping up there you know, around that tree oh, and, the, okay. and the wood line. Do you see what I mean? Sure. And sure. They, they were an absolutely intelligent, you know, um, and mm -hmm. it, just the feeling and everything they were getting. And as you're talking to them, it's almost like that overused term, ghost whisperer. You're talking to them like human beings. You're being uh, not rude. You're just saying, okay, look, 
You know, let me explain something. Have you seen this? And, you know, have you seen things change? So it seemed to them, to from that group, they did sometimes see things change. They were over the fact of people coming in and asking, because so we don't answer. You know, they, they come in, there, you know, and they didn't use the word rude. They used the word, um, gosh, I wish I could remember, but my brain just went mush. It was basically they were saying, you know, they come here and are yelling at us. Why would we, you know, this is, you know, sure. crazy. And they were just very agitated, but they calmed down in just a very few minutes, you know, when they just kind of read your intent. People don't realize a lot of this is telepathic. If you can pick up mm-hmm. their energy, they can pick up yours. So I think that's mm-hmm. why sure. you get a lot of response. You know, I know you've gotten some great EVPs by just doing that, you know, speaking right. to them like right. you would, uh, you know, just any person on the street, a little respect. So now as as far as EVPs go for you, what have been some of your favorites? Was it like Mississippi or my favorite? My favorite is heaven. That's my favorite. But oh, yeah. Got- <laughs> yeah, that was... Uh... That was interesting. That was out at the railroad engine house, uh-huh. which and Rob Conover was there. He is a, a Midwestern uh, medium, and that was interesting too to bring him to Gettysburg. It's the first time he'd ever been to Gettysburg, and I was going to take him on a brief battlefield tour. We get out to the first day's battlefield, and he just froze. He just shut down. I said, "Rob, are you all right?" He goes, "No." I said, "What's the matter?" He says, "They're everywhere. They're all over here, and they're all they're all suffering." Mm-hmm. I said, do you want to leave? He says, yeah, absolutely. So we got him out of there because it was just just too much mm-hmm. for him because he was so sensitive. But mm-hmm. when we got him to the railroad engine house, then later on that evening, uh, he said that he uh, had heard, he was hearing um, a, um, a soldier who was kind of, he was like a lay preacher. Mm. And he was, he was talking, he would go around and... and and uh, provide comfort to to the men in the unit that he was in. And um, Rob finally said, "I, you know, you don't have to stay here. You're not stuck here. Let me help you mm-hmm. cross over." He said, "Now just look." And he went through the whole thing. He said, "Just look. You'll see people you know and this and that and friends and everything." He said, "What do you see?" And I'm getting, I'm recording this whole thing, and all of a sudden, you hear a voice go, "Heaven." Mm. So and it was almost, and the way he said it, it was almost like it was a confirmation. All of a sudden, he realized what I've been preaching to these fellows about all this time is, mm-hmm. is available to me. Mm-hmm. And and so he moved on. Mm. But uh, we got that twice, as a matter of fact. Him saying heaven. But uh, yeah, that's that's a good good bit of EVP that I got. Plus the Mississippi when I asked uh, in a in the basement of the Cash Town Inn. Which was a Confederate hospital. Uh, one of my mediums said, "There's a, there's a soldier who would like to talk to you." See, I, I can't hear them. Okay, mm-hmm. so I need help. Yeah. you know, I'm not intuitive enough to actually actually hear or sensitive enough to actually hear them. But they, so that's why I work with mediums, and they say, "There's a, a fella here by the name of Andrew, mm-hmm. and he would like to talk to you." And so basically, I just said, "Andrew, what state are you from?" And I heard um, four distinct syllables mississippi wow and i really don't have to play that more than twice to any group mm-hmm. before some some people get it the first time most of them get it the second time right and that's why it's important too to think you know a lot of the people out there going wow you know do i need to buy two thousand dollar equipment you know and i think it's wonderful there's so many things out there i don't understand how they work um, mm-hmm. And then there's some that's more, you know, the simpler, like the white noise, you know, you've got the obelisk, you've got the, you know, REM pods, you've got, gosh, look at the stuff, you know, and right. I've heard more um, valid evidence from this most simplest things, you know, like you say, you can't hear them. In most right. cases, I can't. Now you're standing in the middle of that battlefield, you stand in the middle of wheat field and try to de- de- decipher the different entities that are there that the wheat field is just so overwhelming i think it probably i think i slept for two days when i got out of the wheat field because there's just so much 
energy. Everything that happened there was horrible. The, the, the hogs, the screaming for your, your buddy to um, come and get you and you can't move. You can't climb back over the fence or the rock, whichever side you were on, to come and get that person. People right. get desensitized and they don't realize what these individuals went through. It's hot. It's July. You're wearing wool. You know, that's enough right. right there. Most people I know today couldn't get through a day of just that, let alone uh, going through what they went through. The, the the overall stench must have been, you know what I mean? You've got that many people in oh, that sure. amount of town, you know. It's just, yeah, yeah. You know, just just the the normal stuff you don't think about. You've got all the horses. You've got the, the, the you know, the, the dead and dying. It's, you know, it's, what, what was it, like 90-something degrees? It was in the high 80s. It was okay. in the 80s to high 80s, yeah. yeah. And that's, it's hot. And it was, as you said, it was summertime, sure. It was July. Mm-hmm. Uh, horses, you know, were you know, were killed. And that's, you know, a thousand pounds of, of meat that's out there rotting in the sun, not mm-hmm. to mention all the limbs that were amputated, all the men that were that were in in essence gutted when you shot when you're shot in the stomach, mm-hmm. you know, you know what's in your stomach. Mm-hmm. That all comes out. Mm-hmm. Not well, to mention many- the fact that there was a mini ball too, and those things didn't play. You hold one of those things in your hand, and you wonder why you get shot in the arm. Why these people had to get their arms and le- uh, your legs amputated because they couldn't. The bone was crushed; it was shattered. Sure. Well, one of the things also that I that I mentioned in, in at least one of my books and 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 upcoming book is about how how much energy was released mm-hmm. when a man. You know, if you're, uh, the uh, the bones will create if they are cracked or broken they create that's electricity mm. so that's a burst of energy right there how many bones were broken when men were shot you know i mean there were at least fifty one thousand casualties so that's fifty one thousand times over where they were hit and very rarely did they miss a bone you know if you're mm. shot in the chest or in the stomach or mm-hmm. or arm leg whatever those bones cracked that released energy mm. we also know <clears throat> that um uh, the dying is a burst of, of, of photons. They, they aren't visible. It's not visible light. It's in a different, a different spectrum. Mm-hmm. But when, when we die, when the DNA unravels, there is first a burst of light and then continuing a, a uh, release up to three or four days of energy mm. from a body that absolutely has, has no... No, it's clinically dead, mm. and they're still releasing. It's still releasing energy as the DNA unravels, and so this energy was being released on the on the battlefield for days and days and days afterwards. Where did it all go? As we know, energy doesn't vanish. It doesn't disappear. Dissipated. It just changes form. Mm-hmm. Not to mention the fact that you had so many things. There that would actually ca- could capture energy, especially electromagnetic energy. Mm-hmm. Re- um, capacitors, we call them capacitors now. They store energy. They store electrical energy, and they are made out of everything from air to wood to uh, earth to plastic to you know just let everything will hold electricity, and especially quartz. Mm-hmm. Which, as you know, is basically the master crystal. Yep. And we've been using quartz watches for however long we've, mm-hmm. you know, needed them for good fine watch pieces, uh, time pieces. So it's it's there's so much there, and of course granite has quartz, and we see granite all over mm-hmm. the um, uh, battlefield. So granite contains quartz and. People think I'm crazy when I say that, but I say, well, wait a minute, what's 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 holding all those gigabytes of memory in your computer? Mm-hmm. Silicon, you know, it's yeah. the it's it's quartz basically, your you know, silicon chip in your computer. Now the the question is, how do we get the environment at Gettysburg or other battlefields? How do we get it to release this energy? which it seems to do spontaneously. Yes. How do we get to have it happen at our command? 
Mm-hmm. So that then we can study it whenever we need to. And now we have replication, which is part of the scientific method. Mm-hmm. You can do it like a, like in a lab whenever you want. Right. And the laboratory just happens to be Gettysburg or any number of battlefields in America. Well, that's that's absolutely true. I just walked through uh, Fredericksburg. And you also have, uh, don't you have a ghost tour there or something there in Fred is it Fred yeah, we had a we had uh we had a tour of Fredericksburg for a number of years and then it got to be where it was a little bit too uh, difficult so we went virtual with it and then finally we just gave it to our number one guy down there and she's running it still the same stories the same right. uh tour and everything so we're we're not in it but we endorse it the one down at Fredericksburg and of course Fredericksburg um, had four major battlefields. Mm-hmm. Fredericksburg was kind of like the hub, uh, but four major battlefields, Chancellorsville, the Wilderness, Spotsylvania, and Fredericksburg itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's plenty to see and visit down there if you're doing it for the history or if you're doing it for the paranormal. It's a wonderful uh, tour. You know, you go in, you see the um, the movie first, which kind of I was all for because it puts you in the mindset before they release you out on the field and you walk out with a different reverence if you uh-huh. if you know what i mean after you you do yes. that and it was just amazing and i can't mention fredericksburg without mentioning the angel of maria's heights do you know the story right. can can oh, you tell yeah. us a little bit well i think it's important for the listeners because again we're trying to keep in mind that these were human beings and a different type of human being 150 years ago how they could do the things they did. Tell us a little bit about the Angel of Marie Heights. Okay, it, there was a, um, uh, uh, and I'm going to get his name here. For some reason, I can't uh, recall it. Um, and now I can't. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> it just left. Was it Henry? Henry? Uh, wow. Well, no. Let me Google I'll get it here in a second. Are you Googling? I'm Googling it. You go, you go. And his his um his name was Richard Kirkland. Kirkland, that's right. And you know, I I've uh I think I've absorbed too many historic yes. names in my lifetime to get that right off the top of my head, but I knew it. Um at any rate, Richard Kirkland was a uh, a soldier, Confederate soldier, who was stationed behind the um um Confederate line there at the at the the sunken road behind the wall. He's from South Carolina, and he, uh, as you know, the Union soldiers assaulted that wall. They never got within 20 or 30 yards, and they were just mowed down because the Confederates were so well protected. Mm -hmm. And assault after assault after assault, they lost some 4,000 men casualties in just an hour of attacking. And every time they receded, of course, they left the wounded out there. And as soon as you're wounded, you get really, really, really thirsty. Mm-hmm. And these men were crying and calling for their for help and calling for 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 water. And this just got to Kirkland, and he just absolutely couldn't stand it anymore. So he gathered up as many um, canteens as he possibly could get from his from his uh, comrades. And they 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 weren't sure what he was going to do. They were uh, worried about him because he he was going to go out there and help the enemy. And they were like, "They're going to kill you." Mm. And he climbed over the wall and walked out to the first soldier he had um, uh, could reach, and he started giving him water. Mm. And the Union soldiers that were still in the lines saw this, and they were not going to shoot him. And they saw what he was doing. And he got the nickname, the Angel of Marie's Heights. Mm. And um, uh, it, um, uh, I guess one of the, uh, the, the, the I, I don't have it in front of me, but the I believe the inscription on his statue, they, they built a statue for him Beautiful. down there because he was, a, and it said, uh, a, a soldier, Confederate soldier of sublime compassion. And I always mm. thought that was, you know, he just seemed, you know, he, he, he basically went on a suicide mission, but no one shot him. Later on, sadly, he was uh, killed at Chickamauga. Chickamauga, yeah. And, yeah, he was killed there. But that right there gives the listeners a little bit of insight into the intestinal fortitude of the American soldier. South, Union, or, or to today, 
you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing what these individuals went through. I mean, right to the point of stopping the fighting at night and trading tobacco for molasses across the fences, you know, brother, brother against brother, cousin against cousin, yeah. family against family. And a lot of people uh, have asked me too, why do you think there's so much there? And I said, I think that's it. That's it. It's not just the the sheer tonnage of, of death and destruction that went on and the energy there. But it was also the emotional value of what they were going through and the time and the belief, the, the religious beliefs. You know, what was the religions back? It was Lutheran and, you know, they were all very um, mm -hmm. black and white. You know, if you were bad, you know, you did anything bad, you, you weren't going you know, to, to a good place. You were Correct. going to a bad place. And right. I actually, when I was speaking to one of the ones right there in that field, um, it, it's, it's basically the feeling I was getting was I've seen hell. I don't need to see more of it. You know, there's no way we're going to go after what we've done here. There's no way mm -hmm. we're going to go cross over. So I think that's a huge amount. And that's just... A small percentage of the ones that you can get to that point where you can talk to them because it's they're so erratic and repeating over and over again they're suffering they're still going through you know the, they're still marching you've got the ghost regiment you know which is probably oh, yeah, residual sure. do you think that one is a residual I mean as far as much as you've heard are they just repeating it's on a loop or what do you think about that one um, yeah I think you mean the phantom what we call the phantom regiment yes yeah, I think. Well, I definitely think that that is a um, a residual, mm -hmm. and um, that is uh, because it replays over and over and over. And every description I've gotten, and I've gotten about five or six, is virtually the same. Right. That they're a unit of soldiers out maneuvering. Um, they just they appear. Uh, but the interesting part about the most recent one that I got, the most recent report, is that it was a it was a family, a mother and a, and a son, out on the battlefield there near the peach orchard. Mm -hmm. And her her dog, they had the family dog with them, and they drove over the little hill there at the peach orchard, and they looked down in the field, and there was a unit of soldiers marching around, and they thought, my goodness, it must be a, you know, a reenactment group practicing. Mm -hmm. And then, then the dog was in the back, and the dog was growling. The dog saw it, too. Mm -hmm. Wow. And... Um, then a couple joggers came over the hill, and they the whole unit vanished, just disappeared right before their eyes, and the mm -hmm. dog quit growling. The dog, to me, is important because, yes. you know, we have a tendency, humans have a tendency to make up all kinds of excuses why they saw something out of, uh, out of uh, you know, the paranormal. You know, too much maybe to drink last night, uh, like something under my contacts, whatever. Dog just reacted. He just alerted mm -hmm. to that. And so that then is the, I think, the important reason why I, I like to get, you know, stories that have dogs or animals reacting mm -hmm. in it because it's a, it's an unbiased source mm -hmm. for the observation. And I can tell you from experience, Gettysburg is a cat town. There's lots of cats and lots of dogs. <laughs> and my, yeah. my son asked me, he goes, why do you think this? I said, well, you know, if I lived here, I'd be surrounded by cats and dogs because they're your best alarms, you know, for anything like that, you know, plus the fact yeah. they're just cool to have around. But they, that, that goes way back, you know. I mean, I think I almost think that people understood more 100 years ago than we do now in the paranormal because they knew to have – you know, that they were alarms, you know, a, a cat and a dog can see things that we cannot see. You know, and I always tell people, pay attention. If your dog is barking at the corner and you've got a funny feeling, chances are you know, go with your instinct, yeah. go back to the instinct. Like you said in the beginning, we all are born with that intuition and we talk ourselves out of it or we just shut it down. Whatever we do, we all have that, that follow your gut thing. You know, uh, right. animals have it. You know, with the fight or flight, they don't talk themselves out of it. So if we right. could just get back to that feeling and that energy is like if you have have that feeling, then you're probably, you know, surrounded. And I think that's why Gettysburg, you can actually feel it even in a moving car as you get closer to it. 
there is an energy there. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you said a couple of times in your book about, you know, people, tourists will come and go, where's the battlefield? Well, you're standing yeah, in it. Yeah, right, right. You know. Well, you know, and, and the intuitive part of it is, is is very important, and we're getting more and more into that. And I, I always thought one. I always wanted to have scientific proof. Well, I'm kind of getting it mm-hmm. from the use of pendulums and dowsing rods. Yep. And just recently, I was out in Ohio, and uh, where my family was from, and I was invited to do a, an investigation of a local theater. And uh, my cousins still live there, so and we so we met there, and they had never done a paranormal investigation before. And my one cousin, uh, I handed him a um, a pendulum, mm-hmm. and I said, "Go ahead and uh, uh, try and communicate. You don't have to talk. You can just ask some questions." And he was familiar with some of the people who had, who had acted because he's an actor, and he had acted in that theater and had passed on. Hmm. And he got in communication. He got in contact with three of his personal friends, and the, you should have seen the pendulum going crazy. And he, you know, this is somebody who never used a pendulum before, mm-hmm. and and would not know how to manipulate it. You know, and he mm-hmm. wasn't doing it for anybody because we couldn't even hear what he was saying. And he he basically got very emotional okay. when. Um, when that happened, uh, I've seen Carol take her dowsing rods and find graves mm. out on the on the just you know as a, a you know a couple places we've been to they were graves that had been bodies were exhumed mm-hmm. and you can see her walking along the dowsing rods cross she steps into a depression mm-hmm. she backs out of the depression and they uncross. So yes. I'm I'm a firm believer and uh, uh, of, of what you have talked about in terms of uh, of, of the um, intuitive mm-hmm. part of it. I have a question that you can ask Carol. You would probably know um, that night when I did get about seven to listen. It, it was like I said. It was very. We'll have to talk. I have to come visit you again, and we'll just sit down. I'll buy you a, a cup of coffee or a beer, and we'll just talk about this. But. The thing was, is I had to do it quickly, and it it honestly wasn't a problem. Like I said, in 45 minutes, I got more than, you know, 10 years of ghost adventures, you know, because we were just going in with the right intent. And I honestly believe it has nothing to do with me, has nothing to do, you know. There's some kind of a connection there, Mark. It's like, you know, whatever you want to say, your spirit guides, your angels, maybe they connected with theirs. It was time. It was uh-huh. it, it was time, and I really can't explain that because I'm really nobody in this. You know, I'm just a person with a heart. You know, I know what it's like to be a soldier. I know what it's like to do your duty. I know what it's like to have to live with that. You know, maybe it was that sure. energy they connected. I don't know. But, well, it's that and the respect that you give these men, I believe. Yes. I think they know that, that having having been a soldier, mm-hmm. they know that you can empathize with them. Well, so. that's it. You know, and it took a little bit, you know, uh, uh, I, basically I asked to talk to the, the highest ranking person there because I figured the rest yep. would follow. You know, that's yep. just normal. And I got him to listen. I said, please read my intent. You know, I'm not here. To, I'm not taking pictures. I wouldn't do that. I'm only using, you know, the dowsing rods, whatever. I did have the EMF and a small flashlight that someone put at my feet because when they saw I was starting to get, you know, but I asked everybody to stay away. I'm not a, no flashes, no pictures, no nothing respect because i'm also native american we always got that thing where people are afraid of getting pictures because they feel like it told, took part of your soul have you ever heard that one yeah sure so it's possible they're you know even thinking that so whatever at the end of it after i got them i could try to connect them into um that love connection which is hard because look what they just went through do you, you know, think about your loved ones that you missed? you remember what it was like to have a hug? Because that's, you know, that feeling that connects you right in. And everything started to change. All the erratic, everything, all that energy just seemed to melt a little. And when it was all over, the dousing, I felt this like warm, it's hard to explain, a warm wind. I'm sure you've kind of felt it. It's not really a wind, but it's definitely a change in the energy. the dowsing rods start to cross like they were going to give me a yes you know 
and they kept coming. And I honestly, my first thought was, okay, it's reacting to this pull, this wind I'm feeling, this kind of a rush. And I'm watching them and they're crossing and they're crossing and they keep coming. And I'm wearing a heavy leather jacket. It's October. And they keep coming and then they come up to my arms and they squeezed. And I got a hug from a ghost on the Gettysburg battlefield on Halloween night. <laughs> oh, wow. That's great. And I was great. I was wondering if Carol ever got something like that, if she's trying to help her, you know, tell her, you know, to look for that, because I have I never heard about it before. And then I came, ran home and Googled, you know, when I was all done. And it's happened before a, a investigation a lady crossed a, a young girl. And she was using uh-huh. dowsing rods. And the, before she crossed over, she gave her a hug with the dowsing rods. I've heard it a couple of times. So you can get stuff with that kind of equipment that you just can't get. It's hard to get a hug from a, a from an ovalist. And it's hard to get, you know what I mean? You can get a right, thank you. Right, exactly. <laughs> but isn't exactly. that? I have to ask her. I, I, don't, I don't recall her ever saying that. I know that she's asked uh, the dowsing rods, can you... Uh, whoever's operating the dowsing rods, can you point to the other energy in this room? And you see the rods just go mm-hmm. to one side or the other, mm-hmm. you know, and point to another area of the room. So that that's your in- intuitive, mm-hmm. hands-on type stuff. But I don't know about getting a hug. I've been, <laughs> excuse me, I've been tapped. I've had my sleeve pulled mm-hmm. on, on investigation, but never, I don't believe I've ever been hugged. Well, go in there with the dowsing rods <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <not okay. laughs> but I mean, it's just, it seemed to me they found a way and it was just so overwhelming. Like, I'm, I'm telling you, it wasn't a dry eye standing around because I made everybody stand off to the side. I said, look, I'm serious. You know, I'm a five foot two redhead and I just, I'm a Jersey girl. And I just went in there and look, I'm here for on a mission. Back off. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was time, you know, just like the, 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 you know, the, the poor guys in the cellar you know, at Penn Hall, you know, asking for help. You know, I'm telling you, Mark, you name the date and I'll come and sit in the cellar with you. I'm there. <laughs> okay. I am All so right. there. We have, to, we have to get permission to do that. Oh, and, yeah, I can uh, imagine. I have a couple contacts left at um, Gettysburg College. Um, you know, I mean, you can you can visit down there, but you can't, you know, right. uh, you can't stay down there without permission. But um, right, right. we'll see. We'll see. Well, you never know. You never know. I mean, and I have a theory, you know, I have nothing to hold it up, but it could just be that one guy that's making that connection and he's manifesting. This is what I'm seeing. This is what I I mean, that takes so much energy, but my gosh, he's down there with all the electric and stuff. Is he not? So he might be able to pull that off. I don't know. I don't know. So many questions. Well, there are, yeah, that's where a lot of the, uh, like the electrical boxes, the junction boxes are all right there in front of the, uh, at least in the current day now. Of course, they, they vanished. All that vanished when the um, um, individuals had the, had the experience. Mm. So. Wow. It's just, wow, question mark question marks all over the place on that one. Now, more, before, more questions than answers. I, always, it's the paranormal onion. The more you peel, the more you, you know, more layers you get. It's just, it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. It's so fascinating. And I know that you have used some of, you know, the knowledge you've acquired to even do a different kind of investigation into crime scenes and things like that. Right. Yeah, wow. that was one of the, uh, yeah. Catherine Ramsland, a dear friend of mine and co-author, um, she herself has written 60-some books. She's a f- professor of forensics at the Sales University and also was uh, consulted on Bones, CSI, and the new program, Ail- The Alienist, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of forensics. And um, she came up with the idea, and I guess it's, it's, it's sort of a new idea, but it's based on the fact that <clears throat> when CSIs run out of evidence they've gone to all the trace evidence and everything when they run out of evidence can you call in a at the pfis in other words paranormal forensic investigators mm-hmm. to use their methods a, a whole team of not necessarily psychics you know psychics might be involved but a whole team because every as you know everybody seems to have their own specialty some people are better with dowsing rods others are better with EVP. Others are better with photography. To use those skills 
to gather some more data and evidence from the other side to perhaps keep the investigation moving ahead into this particular crime. So um, we've been actually having weekends that we that we pick a crime. We don't tell anybody what the crime is until they get there mm-hmm. in Gettysburg, and then uh, tell them the crime and 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 get them information that they can use to investigate the crime with paranormal methods, using, for example, um, uh, getting EVP from victims or witnesses that have gone on, uh, psychometry, where they hold an item that's associated with the crime, uh, remote viewing, where they actually view the, 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 the scene of the crime, even in the past, you can do that. Mm-hmm. And those are the types of things that, that, that help us gather more data and perhaps, you know, make, make keep the, uh, the, the unsolved crime active again. Mm-hmm. So well, that's, that's what those weekends are about. I think that's awesome because we know um, for a long time, you know, police and investigators have used psychics, but they keep them on, you know, the down low. You know, they'll say, yes. okay, well, the, here's some evidence. Go back and check that evidence again because, you know, the person is saying this. We also know that it's very hard for a psychic detective or a psychic person to say, okay, um, well, she showed up in my kitchen and I know where the body's buried because they get locked up. <laughs> you know, at least for a while, yeah. it happens. It's happened multiple right. times, you know, because, why, well, how do you know the body, you know? Um, exactly, yeah. So that happens, but um, I think they're opening a little more to it. Again, you know, in our lifetime, we've seen some huge changes in that department, too. So what have you found? What were some of your favorite things that since doing this part of it? Well, we have, um, uh, let's see, how can I, officially investigated uh, one crime. I really can't get into too much because we right. may use the crime again. But we, what happened is that we did get in contact with the victims mm-hmm. and found out that the, one of the, the perpetrator, it was also a suicide after he had, had, had done this, he killed himself, was still intimidating the mm-hmm. victims, his victims, uh, into silence. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a while, I was getting EVP from the victims, and then all of a sudden, he showed up. I apparently asked the wrong question. Mm-hmm. He showed up, and that was it. Okay. The EVP stopped. And um, so, and then eventually what happened is that over actually the course of three of these weekends, one of our mediums, Patty Wilson, who is also a co-author of mine, mm-hmm. uh, crossed over, attempted to cross over the uh, the victims. She was successful, Good. and the perpetrator was very, very angry mm-hmm. and would not cross over. She tried to cross him over, too, mm-hmm. but he was having none of it. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things that, that we've run into. We do have other crimes that we've kind of been investigating. One I can mention, because it may be a while before we get into it, is the the crime made famous by the uh, movie and book uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Okay. The the, uh, crime that was down in uh, Jim Williams, uh, down in Savannah, Mm -hmm. uh, Georgia. And so we've been in contact with some of the victims, well, the victim of that crime, Danny Hansford. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's the that's, that may be the next one we do, but but you found out so much in that one thing, Mark. If you look at it, you know it's. I have been in situations where the very same thing happened, where you're trying to help one and you're communicating with one, and she's saying, "Hurry because he's coming." You know, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. and you know who's coming, and then you have to decipher what's going on. Um, I've actually been in a situation where it took almost like three mediums to kind of hold that one back, you know, and how they did it, I uh-huh. couldn't tell you, you know, I'm not privy yeah. to, to that 
ability while you know you're trying to communicate with this other one to get them connected because you're trying to connect them into those higher vibrational things the love the light and all that just so they can see the light again meanwhile this one's trying to keep them in the negative lower vibrational stuff so you're going to fight that it's it's so wild you know, but we know that they can be in the same house and be aware of each other and they can be mm -hmm. in the same house and not be aware, you know. Right. So the fact that you're talking to them and it seemed to me when you were telling it that once you connected into even whether you spoke it or whether you connected in telepathically to that spirit's energy, he showed up. Right. Wow. Well, when we started, when we started uh, asking questions that he didn't want the victims to give the answers to that's mm -hmm. when he shut them down and mm -hmm. very very intimidating individual mm. and uh and young victims so it was uh it was interesting yeah what amazing but you you're finding ways to use this and i'm just i just gotta say i'm so proud of you because you've you've, you've gone through all of this you know, and you've really touched on quite a lot of different vantage points of it. I mean, from being a guard, from being this, and then author, and you're listening to the stories, and you're putting them all together, and then you've you've kind of got it down to that. You know, the investigate the investigator part of you is taking that and and taking it to another level. And I think a lot can be learned. Uh, you have a couple books on uh, investigation. You want to name those just for people that are are interested in doing that. Sure. Well, you know, along with the seven, soon to be eight volumes of Ghosts of Gettysburg, mm -hmm. um, there's also the uh, Ghost Hunters Field Guide, Gettysburg and Beyond, which mm -hmm. is basically a how-to, where-to. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do a paranormal investigation at Gettysburg, it tells you how, basically how to do it and um, also how to uh, or where to do it. In other words, places not only on the park, but in the town itself and places where you can go mm -hmm. and uh, Stay there all night. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a uh, interesting uh, book. And the other one has to do with Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville, mm -hmm. which is our um, uh, other, you know, where we have our tours, mm -hmm. or had our tours. And it's Ghost Hunters Field Guide to Civil War Battlefields. Mm -hmm. Basically the same thing, how to, where to. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very, it's kind of indispensable because there are places in Gettysburg that they're just so tired. Of this kind of mess you know they're not going to let you on you're going to wind up seeing a security guard before you see a ghost so Correct. you definitely want to take that into account you know um, but I can tell you if you just want to go and pick up the feeling definitely take the tour through go you know walk up little round top sit there be quiet just sit on the rock listen to the wind through the leaves and I guarantee you you know if nothing else you're going to feel it you know when you look down and you know um, wasn't it boys from Alabama were coming up, you know, fighting to get up those rocks and, you know, get right. pushed back down. Um, right. I don't know how you feel about the movie Gettysburg. Were you involved in that at all? Were you a consultant or were you? you know? I was, no, I was not, but I got uh, letters from participants, the uh, reenactors, explaining some ghost stories that, that had happened, some paranormal experiences that they had while they were. Uh, in uniform mm -hmm. and helping to film it. Absolutely. I can imagine because there they were, you know, and they could connect into that. You know, I know you've had a lot of experience too with people when you wear a uniform, you know, and you're trying to communicate, you get a little bit better of a reaction and, and, and things like that. So there's so many aspects to this. And um, I just really think that you have a fresh look you know, and and so many, like I said, vantage points to look at it, you know, and you're taking it to that next level. And I look forward to what's coming next with you, you know, and and, mm -hmm. I, and I, I just love the whole uh, crime scene investigation, everything before. I know we've taken up so much of your time, Mark, and I, I'm so glad you came on this side of the gate to give us a little more insight. Would you tell everybody uh, one time before we let you go um, how, how to contact you and about a little bit about your tours and all? Yeah, well, the tours are going seven days a week now, mm -hmm. and um, they will be continuing all the way uh, into um, November. So I think the people need to do is uh, make the reservation or contact us through ghostsofgettysburg.com. That's mm -hmm. plural ghosts, not just one. Mm -hmm. Ghostsofgettysburg.com. Uh, 
And um, that's the way to find out what's going on in Gettysburg when I'll be autographing at the uh, at our stop there and how to make a reservation or at least get the phone number and call and find out more information. So that's that's the main thing uh, on, on the computer. Great, great. Can they get the books through there as well or...? We have an online bookshop uh, or a, uh, well, actually you can get t-shirts or hats mm-hmm. or whatever you want, but the books are available online. Once again, ghostsofgettysburg.com. I'm looking at it right now. It's a fabulous site and it it's a great shop. And um, like I said, I've been in there a couple of times to speak to you and it's always a wonderful experience. And I just thank you so much for giving us so much of your time today. I think it was a wonderful conversation and I could go on for hours. But uh, I'm definitely going to have you back on again. Will you come back? Sure. Absolutely. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Well, thank you, Cisco, for having me. Thank you again to Mark Nesbitt for spending so much time with us. It was a wonderful conversation. And thank you to his wife, Carol, for getting all that together. Also, if you have your paranormal stories or stories of your bump in with the uncanny please email us at journey through the gate at gmail.com connect in with us on our facebook discussion page journey through the gate paranormal portal podcast the gatekeepers where you can discuss your experiences or help someone else who's had one now as always keep your feet under the covers Keep that closet door shut, because there are things that go bump in the night.
Gettysburg's guns are still, and the dead sleep on. America's most famous battleground is a camp again, with a road dividing the blue and gray. There is no other dividing line now, as 2,500 veterans gather from north and south to mark the 75th anniversary of America's Armageddon. Hello! Hello. The trumpet to that shall never call retreat. He is lifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is mine. Veterans of the Blue and the Gray. Of the United States, I accept this monument in the spirit of brotherhood and peace.